Welcome back. Next we're going to talk about structures. So I've opened up the playground again. Traditionally we've referred to instances of a class as objects. However, because Swift classes and structures are so much alike, it's preferable to use the more general term instances. Even though these two types have a lot of similarities, they're handled by the system very differently. Structures are values which are always copied when they're passed around, whereas classes use reference counting. This means that more than one variable can reference a specific class instance, but you'll never have multiple references to the same instance of a struct. Here's what structs and classes have in common. Both define properties to store values, both define methods to provide functionality, and don't worry if you don't know what all these things mean. Both define subscripts to provide access to their values when using the subscript syntax, both define initializers to set up their initial state, and both can be extended to expand their functionality beyond a default implementation. Last, both conform to protocols to provide standard functionality of a certain kind. And here's what classes actually add in functionality on top of that. In classes, you have inheritance, which enables one class to inherit the characteristics of another. And in classes, typecasting enables you to check and interpret the type of a class instance at runtime. You also have deinitializers, which enable an instance of a class to free up any resources that it has assigned. You also have reference counting, which allows more than one reference to a class instance. There's a lot more to say about structs and classes, but let's back up a bit and just define our first struct. In Swift, as in Objective-C, it's preferable to name our structs and classes using camel case typing, beginning with a capital letter. Some struct is going to be the name of our struct, and you just type struct. And that's it. Well, that was pretty easy. It doesn't do much yet, though. Let's create another struct that has a couple of values for us to work with. Struct geo point var latitude equals 0, 0.0 and var longitude equals 0, 0.0. Now that was a fairly straightforward declaration that defines a new struct of type geopoint. We give this struct two properties, longitude and latitude, and declare these properties as doubles. Although you don't see any explicit double declaration, by setting their default value to 0.0, .0 we signify to Swift that these properties are doubles through type inference. Now let's use this struct. So far, we've only defined what a geopoint looks like. If we want to interact with it, we must create an instance. So the syntax for the new instance is similar to the class initialization and it looks like this var new geo point so we're just creating a variable here is equal to geo point open close parenthesis now we can set and interact with the properties of this struct using the traditional dot syntax new geo point dot latitude is equal to 42.8572 and new geo point dot longitude is equal to negative 12.4222. However, Swift automatically generates a member wise initializer for structures that allow you to set all of the properties at its initialization. So we can type var member wise geo point is equal to geopoint. And here you can see that we can set those properties right here. 12.324 and longitude is 29.1111. Now let's look at a bit more advanced version of a struct loosely based on Apple's implementation of CGREC. This also includes a method and other structs as properties. I'll show you a slightly different declaration and initialization demonstration. So when I say method, we're just saying methods are just functions that are going to be associated with a particular type, in this case, the struct. By defining a function within the brackets of our struct, we're indicating that this function is a method for that type. Let me get to methods more later. First, let's define this struct, which is going to be called point with a capital P. And we'll say var x is an int 
and var y is an int. And then we'll define a struct called size. And we'll say var width is an int. And var height is an int. And then we'll define one more structure called rect. var origin is a point and size is is of type size and now we will define a method function center returns a point var x is equal to origin.x plus size dot width divided by 2. var y is equal to origin dot y plus the size dot height divided by 2. And then what we'll do is we'll return this struct point x is x and y is y. There are a couple of things different about these. The first thing that you probably noticed is that we declared all of our variables on one line. This is a language feature of Swift and it can be used in other situations throughout the language. For example, we can say var 1 is equal to 1, 2 is equal to 2, and 3 is equal to 3. And then we can say 1, 2, 3. We can also do this with constants. If we were to change this var to a let, it also works. So this can be used at your discretion, where it would aid in readability. You probably also noticed that we declared explicit types for our values. This is because we don't set any default values, and Swift can't use type inference to know what kind of variable these should be. Let's try and instantiate a new rect like we did before and see what happens without any default values. So var new rect is equal to rect. We get an error. Missing argument for parameter origin in call. Swift doesn't like the empty values and we must have something set in all of our properties at initialization time. This is a language feature designed to avoid common programming errors. If a value must be able to be nil, then you should declare this possibility explicitly via an optional, technically setting a default value of nil. Luckily, as we mentioned earlier, there's a memberwise initializer automatically generated for us, and we can use this to make sure that all of our values are set on initialization. So we're going to use the memberwise initialization, var origin is equal to point and we can set x to be 0 and y to be 0. Now we can do uh, the size member wise initialization. var size is equal to size and we can set width to be 100 and height to be 100. And let's do a a rect memberwise initialization now that we have both of those. We can set the rect, the origin to be the origin which we defined above, and the size to be the size which we defined above. Now we can interact with our rect as needed. For example, to alter its width, we can type rect.size.width is equal to 80 and then we can type rect, and it will give us these properties over here. Now let's make use of that method we declared earlier to find out what is the center of our rect. So if we type var center equals rect.center, we find out that it's x40 and y50. We talked about earlier that structs are value types. That means that they're always copied when they're assigned to a variable or a constant, or passed as an argument. Let's see what this looks like in practice. Let's use our point structure because it's a little simpler for explanation. We're going to create a new point. 
point 1 is equal to point, x is equal to 10, y is equal to 10. Now point 2 will have identical values of point 1, but it is technically a new instance of the value. var point 2 is equal to point 1. So if we were to modify point 2, now point 1 and point 2 are different. Point 1.x is 10 and point 2.x is 20. There's one more thing I'd like to discuss about structs before we move on to classes. This is the concept of mutating methods. If a method inside of a struct will alter some value of that struct, it must be explicitly declared as a mutating method. Let's take a look at an example. So this is going to cause an error, what we're typing right now. So we're going to make a struct called foo, and we're going to make a var called some property, and that's going to be equal to 0.0, .0 which means it's a double. Then we're going to create a function called increment sum property and we're going to pass it a double which by default is going to be equal to 1 and then we're going to set self dot sum property is going to be plus equal to the increment and we see that this throws an error could not find an overload for plus equals that accepts the supplied argument. This is triggered because the function hasn't been given permission to mutate the instance itself. That doesn't mean it can't be done. We just need to notify the compiler that we're going to do that via the mutating keyword. We also make use of the default value that was discussed earlier in the functions. So for this function we just type here mutating and that gets rid of the error. So now we can say var my foo is equal to foo. And we can say my foo dot increment some property. And we don't have to enter anything in here because it has a default value. And then we can say my foo dot some property. And we can see that it's equal to one. And then we can call increment some property again. And for the increment this time, we'll type 2. And now when we trace my foo dot some property, we see that it's equal to 3. Thanks for watching this tutorial on structures. Next up, classes. See you in a second.